afternoon. Uh, we had a, I opened the uh, public meeting at 1.30. We recessed right away and went to an executive session. I'll now uh, close that executive session and uh, reconvene the public meeting. And the first item uh, is roll call and let the record show all three commissioners are present. Our next order of business is the uh, public comment period. And do we have anyone signed up for the public comment? Anyone happen to grab them? I didn't. Crystal, would you please check? At the time that we came in, there was no one signed okay. up. No. Anyone? So is there anyone that didn't sign up that wants to uh, make a public comment or didn't know about signing up? Okay, great. Um, the uh, next item is the consent agenda. Commissioners, I have passed on a correction on the change to consent agenda item C, authorization to sell vessel, pursuant to resolution number 947, and the only change being the date has been changed on the front cover to May 22nd. So with that in mind, a motion to approve the consent agenda items A through C. Any discussion on the consent agenda, agenda gentlemen? No. Uh, on the back of the uh, item B, the uh, derelict boathouse, it's uh, got everything caving in on it, the roof and stuff, to get rid of that is nice. So I, I appreciate uh, Good move. getting that replaced and out of there. I've had a few citizens call and complain and say, walk along there, how bad that looks. So glad we're doing that. So, uh, none, hearing no other uh, comments, all those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes 3 0. The next item is a presentation uh, by Tamara on our financial, uh, our, our first quarter financials. Tamara Subject, Director of Finance. Oops. I guess we won't start at the end. Commissioners, this is our opportunity to talk about the first quarter financial performance, and I always like to start with the balance sheet. It's sort of a, a temperature of the port, the financial temperature. Uh, looking at total assets, sorry, the first column to the right is as of 12-31-2014, and the column to the left is three months later, the end of March. So the total assets you can see have decreased a bit uh, for the first quarter, and that's just due to depreciation, nothing alarming there. The total liabilities have also decreased, and that's due to us making our bond payments on time every time. Our first bond payment of the year is due in January, so we make that. And then looking at our net assets, it did they did increase from 219 million to 220 million in the first quarter. One thing I'd like to say to the commission is the last time I was up here a couple months ago reporting for the end of the year, those net assets were about 223 million. The adjustment was made the beginning of March for a year-end environmental liability, and that adjustment was about $5 million increase to our environmental liability. So we're up to about $108 million today. Looking at our net asset trend, um, you can see that it has flattened. It used to be a little bit uh, steeper. Uh, we're keeping an eye on that. The flattening is mainly due to two things, that environmental liability increase as well as our net income um, not, as, not as robust as expected. Um, and we'll talk about those details in just a little bit. Hey, Tamara. Yeah. Would, wouldn't we expect, though, that with some, the maturity of some of these things that have been going on for a while that, that we should see a flattening? You mean a decrease in the environmental liability? That and, you know, some um, built-out space that's filled, um, that sort of thing, as opposed to constantly adding new, new assets like new space and all that? Yeah, that's a great question. And the... If I understand your question correctly, every year our consultants look at our environmental liability, the entire portfolio for the port, not just the waterfront. And we look at inflation, it's because it's such a long-term look, um, they inflate it every year. And so inflation is a big part of it. 
And then the Harris Avenue shipyard costs, um, new information, that estimate has increased as well. So those two things have increased our liability. And then that's adjusted off. We are doing work, um, but it's just not offsetting those adjustments. Did, was that your question? Uh, it's close enough. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So where are we keeping our cash? We have about $13.5 million invested a little bit longer term, um, nothing beyond five years based on our, <clears throat> based on our investment policy. And those are returning about 1.3% per year. The remainder of our cash is invested in the local government investment pool, and that's earning about 0.16%. Looking at revenues and expenses port-wide, the first three months we saw about $7.5 million in revenues and about $7 million in expenses. So we'll talk about the green and the pink portions of these graphs in just a little bit. The yellow portion is the non-operating. So the non-operating revenues of 1.9 million are basically our taxes and interest income on those investments. 2.9 million in non-operating expenses uh, is largely the depreciation on our current assets as well as uh, interest expense on our debt. So getting into the individual divisions, the aviation financial highlights. The green bars in front are first quarter results. The pink bars behind that are what we budgeted for that time period. And then the blue bars behind that is the same time period the prior year. So we showed about $1.9 million in revenues, which was a little below budget, <clears throat> and about $300,000 lower than prior year. And that's mainly due, it's a little bit across the board, but mainly due to concession fees and parking. Expenses were about 1.4 million, and that was $150,000 below budget. So we're keeping those under budget, but they were a little bit higher than 2014. Staff is looking really hard at this division. We're pulling back services to see if we can respond to the market conditions. We're looking at janitorial, supplies, just every line item to see if we can um, respond in a flexible way and not have our costs fixed. Um, the other thing we're looking at are increased opportunities for other revenues. For example, the aviation division implemented an advertising program in 2015 that we hadn't budgeted for. So we're not only looking to hold our expenses, but we're also looking for other revenue opportunities. Looking at the marinas division, our revenues came in about 1.3 million, which is well below budget, um, but right close to prior year. And this is not a function of the business, this is a function of budgeting. And the finance staff is meeting with Marina staff this week to see if we can seasonalize that budget so that we have a better idea of how we are doing compared to what we expect. So next quarter, uh, when I'm up here, that will look a little more in line with what's really happening. Expenses came in about, uh, 500,000, uh, that's below budget, but a bit more than 2014. So like the aviation division, we're also looking very closely at monitoring these expenses and making sure that we can respond. Uh, there's not much fluctuation in the revenues and expenses in the Marine Terminals Division. Um, there was about $545,000 in revenues, which was right on budget, and about $318,000 in expenses. That's a little lower than budget, but we do have some summer seasonal expenses coming up, uh, so we may see that creep up closer to budget. The real estate uh, enjoys high occupancy in our, in our buildings, and so there's a steady stream of revenues there, and they're pretty spot on with those. $1.5 million is what we saw for the first three months. About $375,000 were spent on expenses, and like the Marine Terminals Division, I do expect those expenses to start creeping up toward budget as we do grounds and preventative maintenance tasks. 
our overhead, these are our admin divisions, executive planning, things of that nature. We have a little bit of revenues for conduit leases and fiber leases, but nothing really to speak of. Um, expenses came in about $737,000 for these divisions. Not much fluctuation, but we do continue to watch every line item as we are you know, part of the port's uh, expense line items. Public priorities, we um, saw nearly $300,000 in the first three months, and that is mainly due to our stork craft lease and our meetings and events short-term uh, rental space. We should see those revenues pick up as these events um, get busier throughout the summer months. Expenses were about $745,000, uh, which is pretty well below budget, $165,000, a little higher than last year. One thing to note here is the public records disclosure or the public records request expenses were about $35,000 in the first three months. Yes. Tamara, how does that compare, the public records request expenses to last year, year before, whatever? That is a great question. We just started tracking those very specifically okay. about halfway through last year. Okay. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that. Is that on top of the, so there's, um, we've got Amy running that program now, right? Um, so that, does that, 35,000, is that part of Amy's uh, salary and no. bookkeeping and how does it all? No, we have two divisions, one called records management, which uh -huh. is the records management of the port and that includes Amy and um, organizational, things like that. Public records, program, public disclosure, excuse me, program is strictly identifiable expenses like legal expenses or copying costs, direct staff costs. If there's a public disclosure request that comes in, I track how much time it takes me to, to fulfill that and my time is charged, like everybody else's time is charged to that program. Okay. Have, Amy's time is charged there as well, correct? For, for any specific records request that she works on, she would charge her time to that line. Item. That's right, but it's very would, specific time. That would reduce her salary on the public records side and right. add it on Push the it public there, disclosure right. side. So, so staff time is included is in this as well. Did yes, but okay. only very specific identifiable. It's not a percentage of anybody's salary. It's it's hour by hour tracked. The savings in having our legal uh, department look all this up, uh, we should have saved some money there. Does that show up in this 35,000? That 35,000 does include legal expense, and I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, I mean, question. if, if uh, Frank Shop was looking up some of the public records where Amy's now doing it, didn't that save us some money? It, it did, commissioners. The, 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 the process, Diane, McLean did an excellent job before, and she would be in charge of, of uh, locating all of the public records. So she would go and contact all of the places or the people where public records would be stored at the port, and she would aggregate them. And then um, uh, there would be a legal review of records for exempt documents, which primarily are are interagency, inter, intra-agency memorandums or attorney-client privilege documents or real, some real estate documents. When Amy was hired, um, the process remains the same except Amy has more time because that's her job and so she does an initial review and therefore the amount of, of, in, uh, the amount of work that my office does is less because Amy's doing the work a lot of the work at her end of the her end of the process, but the process remains un, unchanged. She is she gathers the documents from port staff. She does the initial screen, and only when she has questions or particular circumstances, they come over to our office to look at particular issues. So, I, and Diane may know more. But I think that's the essential change in the process. Thank you. Um, before we leave that, what, any reason why we're 35,000 up on that? We're not 35,000 up, we're just, that's just the cost today. Oh, that's just today. what it was. Oh, that's just what okay. it is. I completely misunderstood yeah. then. Okay, okay. And, and that was a question I had, that 35,000 included yes. the public records that we got from Frank a year ago, so. 
some the expense. It, it, it's hard to do a direct comparison because the department didn't exist in the past. We didn't track it this way. Now we've created its own page for both public records and public disclosures or records requests. And so to, in order to compare it, you have to go through a bunch of different departments and pull out expenses. And so it's really hard to do a, a apples to apples comparison. And we will be able to next year. Um, and we believe in theory that we are changing, saving some money as well just by seeing our legal bills and knowing uh, what we spent in the past. And, and commissioners, I might add that I believe there's a cost savings. Some of that's dependent on the type of request you get. And, and frankly, in the first quarter, we've gotten some pretty significant public records requests. Uh, but the second thing that the commission should be aware of, in my view, uh, with all due respect to Diane, because she had so many duties at the port, that Amy is able to focus more on this. And in a sense, we have a, a, a better process now, if you will, the level of customer service is, is better. Uh, you know, the process is getting more and more organized. And Amy's instituting new procedures, as I understand it, as we, as we speak, to further streamline the process. Uh, all of which uh, is the difference when Diane didn't have, you know, like she had 47 things to do, and that was one of them, and Amy has this to do. So there is a, an increase in, decrease in expense, increase in kind of service, I think, would be a fair way to say it. Decrease in time. You know, I, I think there's one other advantage too. I think it, it certainly helps us track these costs uh, and inform us when we're talking with our legislators, but it also gives the public a really good understanding for the first time ever of how much that, that activity costs here at the port. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's spot on. That's one of the reasons we made that switch is we wanna know exactly how many dollars we're spending on this area. So thank you for pointing that out. Great, so that's the end of the numbers portion. Uh, risk management activities, I am happy to report no major incidents occurred during the first quarter of 2015. We do have two incidents that happened, in la happened last December that uh, we are continuing to investigate. They haven't become claims for or against the port yet. Uh, the Horizon Fairbanks uh, breaking free during a windstorm and then the FMIP Building 6 fire and we'll keep the commission uh, updated as, as this progresses. Open claims for the port, there's nothing new here. The GE boast fu boat fire, as well as the AMHS passenger ramp are still open. One thing to note is the repairs were completed under a public works contract for that passenger ramp. Open claims against the port, again, the two that uh, have been on there for a while, the passenger ramp as well as the GE East <coughs> boat fire, um, both claims are still open. Commission has asked that we report quarterly on the stormwater program. Uh, con consistent attainment was achieved in the third quarter of 2014, and so samples weren't required during the first quarter, and all training and record keeping are in compliance. Again, no recordable injuries to report the first quarter of 2015, more good news. And also, uh, Elizabeth and the Safety Committee has implemented a monthly safety meeting for this admin building. And we had our first one, uh, I believe this month, and learned how to refresh on how to use the fire extinguisher, and I'm hoping that's not what's included. That's not what's in the fire extinguisher box. And then the capital repairs or replacements, capital projects. Uh, first quarter is usually pretty light because we're just getting started on that, but we did, had two, did have two that were completed or near completing. The sprinkler replacement. Uh, this is a capital maintenance work to replace the underdock sprinkler system, and this was about a $150,000 project. And then the gate three fire standpipe is nearing completion uh, within the m next month or so. And this was in response to the city fire ordinance. This will supply water to boathouse sprinklers in the future. And to date, this cost approximately $1.2 million. So are there any questions or comments? You need a really long arm, so when I'm over there, <laughs> good luck with that. So the, Rob, you might help me on this one. So uh, this is related to the purchase of the, the new building at the Bellwether, the, the port, the new office building. Well, it's not new, new to the port. 
Where did the funds come from for the purchase of that building? Was that, was that pulled out of the LGIP? Just the general fund, yeah. They would still would have been, they would have otherwise been invested in the LGIP, that's correct. All right, and that's returning what, 0.1%? 0 0.16. 0.16%. Uh, where's our guru, Shirley, is she here? He's back there, it's six to seven percent cash on cash. So you know, so you knew where I was going with that, didn't you? So but the Bellwether's returning about 6%. Yeah. So money that otherwise would have been invested in the LGIP, we brought it home, bought a local building, and it's returning better, a better rate much, of return. Much better, so yes. Now if we can get the bell, our ballroom moving, then we're good, awesome, thank you. Yep. Jim, did you have anything? No. Thank you very thank much, you. Tamara. Next is a presentation from uh, Airline Industry Forecast, Inc. Dan will introduce our guest. Yeah, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Daniel Zank, uh, Director of Aviation. Uh, in light of uh, what we've been seeing out of Bellingham Airport, or the trend of uh, decreasing in plane passengers, I thought it'd be a good idea to give an industry update to the commission. And uh, to do that, I brought in an expert, uh, our consultant from um, Forecast Inc., uh, Mr. Ben Munson. Ben is a vice president of Forecast Inc., the air service uh, development firm that represents Bellingham. Ben has worked in various consulting and airline capacities over the previous decade, including five years of work with both Alaska Airlines and Air Trans Airways. In Ben's current role, he works on behalf of several airline and airport clients, including Bellingham, providing support in the areas of air service development, airline route planning, revenue management, and financial planning. In addition, Ben manages uh, Bellingham's dialogue and commercial relationship with both of our existing airlines, Alaska and Allegiant. And with that, he has a presentation he'd like to present to you, Ben. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to the commission to uh, having me here today. Um, in light of some of the capacity trends that uh, that we've seen at the Bellingham Airport, I do think it's important. So appreciate Dan, uh, Dan, Dan inviting me up and uh, being able to take you through this today. Um, as Dan mentioned in his introduction, my name is Ben. I'm with the firm Forecast Inc., who's engaged with the port um, to help manage the commercial side of the relationship with the airlines, um, both the existing carriers, Alaskan Allegiant, and also potential airlines for the port. Um, an important part of that, of course, is understanding the industry dynamics um, in the airline industry, whether they're on a macro level or really specific to our market in particular. And so with that in mind, I've built the following presentation for the port, broken out into four sections. The first is a Bellingham capacity outlook, uh, more looking forward than, uh, than in the rear view mirror. An important part of our engagement with the port is monitoring what's happening at the airport in terms of employments, in terms of passengers by market, what's happening to overall demand to the average fare. What do we think the airline's profitability is here in Bellingham by route? Um, and also, of course, what do we expect capacity to look like going forward? Uh, so for, for this portion of the presentation, really focusing on the capacity outlook. In the forward parts of the presentation, I want to speak to some of the challenges that we're facing here in Bellingham, follow that up with what opportunities are out there to reverse the trend of negative capacity and how we plan to capitalize on those opportunities. Uh, before we get into the net results of the capacity outlook, I wanted to break out specifically what is happening with each one of our carriers uh, here at the airport, starting with Alaska, who through the first five months of the year was relatively flat uh, for Bellingham's capacity and for various reasons uh, that we'll get into through the detail of the presentation, have made some pretty material reductions starting with the summer and fall schedules uh, in 2015, which include the exit of the Bellingham Las Vegas and Bellingham Honolulu markets. Both of those exits are seasonal, uh, so we expect them to come back in the, uh, in the November schedule for Alaska. Allegiance reductions in our market have been a little bit more tactical. Um, they've had reduced frequencies, uh, pull down a flight in Bellingham, Las Vegas, and select day of week reductions in some of our other key markets for Allegiant. We'll talk about some of the reasons that are driving that. Um, and because of a network realignment that's that's happened at Frontier Airlines, uh, they'll also be exiting our market, which will further, further hurt our capacity coming into the summer season uh, when they pull out of Bellingham to Denver. 
Looking at how this shakes out over the course of the year, you'll see to, from left to right, looking at year-over-year -year capacity in terms of daily seats for Bellingham, um, January through December 2015. And when we look at the first five months of the year, those reductions, about 90% of those capacity reductions are driven by Allegiant. Like I mentioned for the first portion of the year, capacity has been relatively felt flat for Alaska. Because of some of those specific high profile reductions that I outlined on the previous slide, we're expecting to get hit very, very hard um, in the summer months, seeing capacity come down as much as 30% on a year over year basis. About 50% of that is driven by Alaska's reductions, uh, specifically the Bellingham, Las Vegas, and Bellingham, Honolulu. About 35% is just the continued Allegiant reductions year over year, and the remainder is a function of Frontier's uh, season seasonal exit of the market. We do expect the market by November, December to rebound, again, on a year-over-year -year basis um, as a function of those markets coming back, Alaska's markets coming back and not having to annualize the year-over-year -year reduction from Frontier because that was only a seasonal service. Looking forward and getting into the details, of course, what's, what's most important is, I think, understanding what has caused that uh, phenomenon at the airport and how we can reverse it. Um, and that'll be detailed in the slides moving forward. Um, the biggest kind of macro component, I think, of what has driven the decline at Bellingham has been a, a function of the declining Canadian dollar, uh, which has declined 13% uh, versus the U.S. dollar in the last 12 months. And if we were to look at it over two years, it's been nearly 30%. Um, and that hurts uh, trans-border airports uh, particularly bad for a couple of different reasons. The first is just it's a, it really constrains trans-border leisure demand, uh, which is, of course, very heavy heavy at the Bellingham Airport. So for a Canadian citizen with Canadian income and Canadian dollars, uh, if there's no change in price point to your hotel in Las Vegas or your airfare on Allegiant, uh, that price just got proportionately more expensive for you. The other side of it is that the airline industry doesn't have a tendency to be hyper-dynamic um, with pricing from a currency perspective and Canadian carriers price in Canadian dollars. Um, so if WestJet, who's our primary LCC competition in Vancouver, is at a price point of $129, that's in Canadian dollars, and they've effectively become that much more competitive versus in Alaska or versus in Allegiant if the Canadian dollar declines. Hey, Ben. Yep. LCC, low-cost carrier. Yeah, LCC is a low-cost carrier. Yeah, thanks. Were there any other questions specific to the, to the dollar decline? Another relevant look here is, is looking at some of our peer group and other kind of uh, border type airports. The three primary MSAs in Canada being Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal actually each have their own kind of border airport comparable to, uh, comparable to Bellingham. In Buffalo, New York, over 50% of their employments are now actually Canadians, primarily coming from the Toronto or Hamilton, Ontario um, MSAs and Plattsburgh, New York which is almost exclusively uh, built on Canadian employments, Allegiant being the primary carrier there. You're seeing that what we've got for, for each one of the tables, the left being Bellingham, the right two being our peer airports, year over year employments by quarter. And you see if we look at the most recent data, being down 7% uh, in 2014 actually compares relatively favorably to Buffalo, uh, one point ahead and quite a bit uh, better. And, and this is really a function of exclusive exposure to the Canadian market, but Plattsburgh being down 15% on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, still, none of these numbers necessarily excuse or would drive the material declines that we're expecting through the summer. There's a couple other phenomena that, that, phenomenon excuse me, that are driving that. Um, something that's been very, very high profile has been Delta's buildup in Seattle. Um, and what we've got here is a quarterly trend. This is Delta's seats um, in the Seattle market um, from a time series to the left 2013 Q1 up through the third quarter of 2015, which we believe to be the final schedule. And you'll see what's most relevant kind of when looking at airline capacity is kind of to compare, make sure it's a fair seasonal comparison, um, but that you're seeing, depending on the quarter, that Delta has roughly doubled their capacity in, in a very short amount of time, on a very large base of seats, 
um, in the Seattle market, and that plays out in a couple ways. It has a massive impact on Alaska, who now represents about half of our capacity on their network and capacity strategy, um, which we'll get into. It also creates a, a much more challenging yield environment in Seattle, um, which makes it more difficult for the, the Bellingham Airport to compete. So when we're looking at the catchment area that theoretically has the choice of driving between Bellingham or to SeaTac, they've got much more competitive fares now in SeaTac. A couple examples of that, we're seeing mid-single digit declines after years of increases in the highest volume markets in Seattle, Las Vegas, Seattle, LA. Some of the markets are getting hit particularly hard. Seattle, San Diego's average fare declined by 20%, um, according to our most recent industry data. So that just has a tendency to pull in passengers and make it a more competitive environment versus Bellingham. This is also something worth noting as well to the extent that we, we engage other carriers and we're continuously doing so. Approaching them about Bellingham, this is something that is on everyone in the industry's mind. It's extraordinarily high profile in the industry now and there's a perception that, that average fares in this area are under incredible pressure as a function of this massive Delta buildup. Uh, this is this is very relevant for us. Alaska's defense of Seattle and how this has played out directly correlates with the previous slide, um, the buildup of Delta's uh, Seattle capacity. And what Alaska Airlines has done as a response is concentrated more of their capacity in the Seattle market. Um, this is again a year-over-year -year comparison looking at 2015 versus 2014. Uh, the left, you'll see what they've done with their Seattle hub. And the right, you'll see what they've done with non-Seattle Seattle market, so markets like the Bellingham, Las Vegas, Bellingham, Honolulu. And what you're seeing, especially starting in the summer months, and I think this directly correlates to the exits of Bellingham, Honolulu, and Bellingham, Las Vegas, when aircraft resources tend to be tight in those months, they're pulling capacity out of what they would consider point-to-point -point markets and reallocating them into Seattle to defend their hub position there. And of course, that will exacerbate the situation of additional capacity in SeaTac and additional fare pressure there. Uh, Legion's migration eastward. Um, this is a, a network phenomenon that we've seen play out particularly um, in, in the first half of 2015. Historically, Allegiance growth over the last couple of years has been very balanced between their western operations and their eastern operations, which are heavily concentrated in Florida. Um, as you can see, if you look at the west coast region outside of Los Angeles, um, which saw a double digit um, year over year capacity increase. Their operations in Phoenix and Las Vegas were roughly flat. They're not necessarily growing those markets anymore, and they've had a major contraction of their uh, their Hawaii services. In comparison, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, Punta Gorda, and Orlando across the border seeing massive increases. It's worth noting, of course, those graphs aren't to scale when you think about kind of the massive percentage increases in some of those, those key markets in Florida. Uh, this is a direct result of the Air Tram and Southwest merger um, that was finalized last year. Uh, those carriers both overlapped quite a bit in the Florida market. As a function of that merger, Southwest dramatically pulled down a lot of their overlap capacity and service into some of their smaller markets, which opened up quite a bit of opportunities for Allegiant and has seen their growth shift eastward. Uh, the final piece is uh, Frontier's Denver hub closure that we're seeing, uh, really seeing play out in our year-over-year -year capacity for the summer months. Uh, Bellingham was one of roughly 30 airports that were closed um, this summer as they pulled down their Denver operation. Historically, Frontier was a carrier that was built as a function of Continental pulling down their hub in Denver, so they served large ONDs from the Denver market, built up a really strong hub portfolio there. A few years ago, under increased pressure from several airlines, including United and Southwest, growing in the Denver market, they rebuilt their strategy in Denver and tried to move into some smaller markets that Southwest wouldn't compete with them in. Bellingham benefited from that, and it was one of the expanded markets. It appears that nationwide that strategy hasn't worked, and as a consequence, they've just dramatically pulled down their Denver hub, um, eliminating over 40% of their Denver frequencies year over year and moving into more point-to-point -point markets. Again, not so dissimilar to, uh, to Allegiant, a lot of them focused in Florida on the East Coast. 
So now with all that in mind, um, turning it around and seeing what opportunities are out there for Bellingham, and then finally we'll conclude with how to capitalize on those. Um, something that I think is of tremendous opportunity for this airport is the growth of the ULCC <clears throat> business model, and ULCC stands for the Ultra Low Cost Carrier. Uh, typically in the U.S. industry, what that's been categorized as Allegiant and Spirit, um, and also as part of their uh, business model transformation frontier as well uh, more recently. And Spirit really exemplifies it better than any other carrier, the tremendous success that they've had with double-digit profit margins and tremendous growth. To the left, you can see the carrier just five years ago. Um, in April 2010, a very limited network domestic U.S. network um, with a little bit of flying to the Caribbean. Now that carrier's grown nationwide. Um, we're seeing a lot of success with this model. The carrier's been very profitable. We're seeing more of a, more carriers kind of shift to, to this concept. And relevant for Bellingham is it's a model that works here. We know that our airport in particular caters to leisure, leisure passengers that could be more price elastic. Um, and I think that it's a very natural fit between the ULCC business model and the Bellingham airport. Airport, and that's demonstrated by the success of Allegiant here. Uh, the next piece is capitalizing on the Delta Hub. So this is something that we see both as a challenge and as an opportunity for Bellingham. Um, so of course, actually starting the summer for the first time, it'll overtake Las Vegas because some of the uh, reductions, but the majority of the seats um, coming out of Bellingham will be going to Seattle, and which makes perfect sense given that it's a natural connecting complex, um, specifically historically for Alaska Airlines hub in Seattle. Uh, because of the massive growth of the Delta Hub in Seattle, uh, looking forward um, because of the nature of their nonstop destinations that they serve, the level of frequency, the amount of seats that they have coming into that market, uh, I think there's a case to be made that that's, that's an opportunity for Bellingham to connect into that network um, and, and enter discussions with, with Delta about kind of connecting, connecting our markets and using their Seattle Hub as a connecting gateway for Bellingham originating passengers. Um, also very relevant is the Vancouver, MSA, both leisure and business has a tendency to generate a high amount of international traffic, uh, which is something that would be very compelling. A huge component to Delta, a huge component of Delta's buildup is international, both to Europe and Asia. Uh, ben, before we move on, you said that the majority of seats this year uh, out of BLI, we'll be going to Seattle? For the summer months. Just for the summer Just months. Just for the summer months. When Alaska's service comes back, the non-stop service for Bellingham, Las Vegas, then it'll tip it in favor again for uh, for Vegas. Is it is it just barely, you know, breaching the 50% point when Alaska brings that service back, or is it swinging wildly back? Well, it's not the it's not necessarily the majority, but it's ranked number one. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry, but was your question with when Alaska brings their service back, is it back 100% of where they previously were? Uh, no. Uh, so when we're when we're we're tipping the majority being fifty one percent. So the majority in the summer months will shift to Seattle, mm -hmm. and the majority will shift back to what? What's the percentage? It's going to shift back to non Seattle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I think I probably misspoke. It's not necessarily the majority, but it's the number one. The number one. Um, number okay. one. Yeah. Okay. So I think it, it probably actually shakes out closer to thirty percent. I don't know what the exact okay. number is, but it wouldn't be fifty. Um, but it does tip in favor of Seattle for the summer months. Vegas takes the number one spot again in the in the fourth quarter. I would expect. Does does that stay pretty? The Seattle to or the Bellingham to Seattle does that stay pretty steady then throughout the year? That is a tendency to to stay more stable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, another couple couple opportunities um, that are out there for the industry. Um, one, if we just move from the from the upper left first, is the American U.S. merger. Um, independently, American and U.S. had, I think, their own unique challenges that would make it difficult to to convince that carrier to come into the market. Um, but each also has unique unique strengths that, when coupled together, I think we've got a much more compelling case when engaging that carrier. When you combine U.S. Airways hub in Phoenix um, and the American brand, which of course is affiliated with Alaska Airlines, um, both from a marketing and from a frequent flyer uh, standpoint. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a game changer there um, and a carrier, like all carriers that, that we engage um, to, uh, to discuss potential expansion into the Bellingham market. Uh, moving to new planes, uh, one thing that we've had have difficulty with, both from Allegiant and from Alaska, is maintaining consistent capacity to Hawaii. Historically, 
of the new narrow body families for most operators in the US. There's two, op two options, the Boeing 737 or the Airbus A320. Historically, the only narrow body that could fly from the Pacific Northwest to Hawaii was the Boeing 737, um, which basically takes off any Airbus narrow body operator as an option uh, to come into this market. Going forward, Airbus has developed a new version, they call it the NEO, um, of their A320 family. Carriers will start taking delivery in 2015 that will have the range capabilities to fly from the Pacific Northwest to Hawaii. That opens up quite a few more options for us, uh, in particular Hawaiian Airlines. And uh, the last piece, and this has been a, a phenomenon that occurred a, a few years back, is that Horizon's fleet transformed, um, Horizon on behalf of Alaska transformed from a fleet that included smaller turboprop aircraft um, to one that exclusively operated with Q400s. Um, they're very quality airplanes, they've got low unit costs, which, which serve certain markets well. But uh, that transformation also op opened up quite a few opportunities throughout the Pacific Northwest for smaller operators, um, which we're starting to see come into full swing. So we're seeing a couple carriers in particular, Seaport and Pen Air moving into the Pacific Northwest with smaller turboprop aircraft that could be uh, utilized into lower, lower demand markets throughout the Pacific Northwest. Uh, ben, mm -hmm. uh, back to the A320neo, mm -hmm. do ultra low cost carriers and low cost carriers buy new planes like that or, or do they typically wait to, to get in that market? It depends on the carrier, that's an excellent question. So Allegiant has had historically their business model works on um, older aircraft types and they, they run really low utilization and low ownership as a component of that. So they don't have outstanding NEO orders. Other carriers like Spirit, um, Hawaiian who's not necessarily ULCC but Virgin America who is carriers like that focus more on high utilization of their assets to drive their costs down. Um, those carriers do have NEOs on order. Okay. Now, finally, is steps moving forward and how can we actually capitalize on those opportunities? Um, the biggest piece is maintaining an active dialogue with both our current carriers and potential new carriers um, for the market. And that's captured by these, these top two points here. There's a couple ways that we do it. Um, one is through kind of the, the conference circuit. Um, there's air service conferences, one that we just attended in, in Denver in early, uh, early 2015, and then also this summer uh, plans to attend one that'll actually occur in Seattle. This gives an opportunity to have various face-to-face -face meetings with carriers that might be a little bit farther out in the planning horizon or, or don't have um, Bellingham as much on their radar as carriers that are interested in, in entertaining an active dialogue. Um, for those carriers, we, we do maintain direct relationships in particular with the revenue management um, and the network planning departments, the revenue management being the ones who kind of evaluate the pricing and the inventory allocations and the network planning departments who are the ones who would have decision authority at the carrier to make a recommendation for a new market or a frequency change. Um, the other, other thoughts and considerations, things that we have moving forward outside of just the straight dialogue with carriers, um, is one, evaluating, this is something I, I foresee happening over the next few months, but evaluating the competitive, competitiveness of Bellingham's incentive program. Uh, the industry is, is very transparent. The carriers uh, each likely have their own estimates of what Allegiance P&Ls are in the market, what Alaska's P&Ls are in the market. They're seeing some of the same phenomenon in their markets with, with the Canadian border type airports and it's making them a little bit more hesitant, I think, to, uh, to be interested in Bellingham service. When you kind of look at a less compelling story, and I do think we have a compelling story for lots of carriers, but something that might feel a little bit riskier from their perspective, it is advantageous um, to have a, a stronger risk mitigation program in place. And I think it's, it's wise for us to go through and just evaluate where we sit and how effective we think the incentive program is being. Would, would uh, one of those missed uh, risk mitigation efforts be like seat guarantees, things like that? I, I think it gets a little bit tricky with the, the FAA for the port to be involved with seat guarantee, but what it would typically be would be cost abatement, whether landing fees, terminal rents, but in particular where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, I think, to move the needles with marketing support um, and, and kind of increasing that lever a little bit. Okay. 
And the final final piece is actually the uh, the 2015 SCASD application. That's the Small Community um, Air Service Program, uh, which involves federal funding. Um, it's an, an application process. I think it's something that we plan to do this summer. It says July 2015 up here. It'll it could be either June or July. It's not the same every year of when the applications come out um, and are due. But well, it's a bidding process to to uh, commit federal dollars to supporting air service development. And unless there's any questions, that concludes the presentation for today. Uh, ben, how long have uh, how long have you worked for the, your uh, firm, Forecast Inc., worked for the port? Uh, the firm, I think, has worked for about ten years. Is that is that right? Ten years. And who is the? What year was the last airline that you brought into Bellingham? Uh, the last airline to bring into Bellingham would have been Frontier. How long ago was that? Three years. Three years ago. So um, is your main goal to get another carrier here in town? Is that, is that your goal as a, uh, a consultant for the Port of, for the Port of Bellingham? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I wouldn't say that we put more focus on a new carrier necessarily. What we're looking for is any avenue uh, to increase capacity at the airport. And the nature of trying to convince a spirit or Hawaiian to, to come into Bellingham that requires naturally a little bit more legwork. They're less familiar with the market. So we, we tend to have a little bit more time absorbed with that. Um, but we're equally interested in, in working. We maintain an active dialogue with both Allegiant and Alaskan Frontier when they were in the market about expanding service, new destination, additional uh, frequency into existing destinations, or even upgaging aircraft um, on their existing frequencies. I guess my concern is uh, I think we spend about $30,000 a year. Is that correct? Some, that sounds about correct. Something in that neighborhood. In the last three years, we've had, uh, at least in the last year and a half, we've had a lot of decreases, no increases. Mm -hmm. You never mentioned Southwest at all or uh, United. Is there a reason? Um, I mean, candidly, I think that those would be a more, more difficult pitch for, for us here, and we do, we've maintained, we've had a, a meeting very recently with United, and um, but we don't see that as a, as a short-term opportunity necessarily for the port based on the feedback that we've gotten from the carrier. Um, Southwest is something that we'd also be very interested in, but the nature of Southwest's business model is one in where uh, because they don't use any contractors and whether it's above wing or below wing operations, uh, they typically have to maintain five or six frequencies per day in a market. Um, so your, that, that becomes the hurdle rate with Southwest and it makes it difficult for them to kind of go into a market like Bellingham out of the gate with five or six frequencies. Canadian dollars is such a factor that it, it's just I don't know what percentage you would put on that as a negative. Mm -hmm. It is, it's very difficult. A good slide to reference, and, and this is a little bit of the challenge that we face, is if I go back, this is a very relevant slide. So if I look at January 2015, and, and from an airline planning perspective, uh, that's typically when you're wrapping up your summer plans. So for your summer 2015 schedule, you're kind of putting your final touches on in January, and then the schedule's published, and you kind of leave it out there to sell and to fly. Um, in January 2015, the carriers had reduced their capacity by 6%. And what had happened is I think employments for that month fell by 10% revenue employments. And so what that means is for the carriers, while capacity is being reduced, they're continuing to see a decline, uh, both in average fare and in the employments at Bellingham. And you know we can we can knock on the door really hard, but uh, when they're having that experience, um, it, it becomes difficult and you kind of get into uh, the situation where, the Bellingham Las Vegas, Bellingham Honolulu, when you've got other contributing factors, reasons that Alaska might be compelled to evaluate capacity reductions in the market, it makes it that much more enticing for them to do so. Well, this past year, you look at the weather patterns here, and then you look in the Midwest and back east, and for flying, it's just been really difficult in the, in the other parts of the country, and yet we've had summertime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do our employment f fees compare with other airports that you uh, that you do work for? It's very very favorable at Bellingham. That's a huge um, 
that's a huge selling point of the airport. When we're engaging carriers, we talk about the cost environment that they experience in Bellingham. It's also advantageous nationwide. We've got, a, I think, a competitive cost structure for, for carriers. They're always looking at their CPE, their cost per employment. Um, and we're, one, we're very favorable from a national perspective, but we're also surrounded by some very high cost airports. Uh, Vancouver is notoriously high. Um, Canada tends to be uh, an expensive place for airlines to do business in general. Um, and then in SeaTac and, and Portland in the Pacific Northwest are, are not cheap airports either. So our employment fees are, are really favorable. How about our airport in general? Well, when I think of the, the fees overall, I kind of think of it in aggregate and kind of what the, the cost per, per employment that carriers are experiencing. I think it's rounded, it's been in the 2 to $3 range. No, I mean o overall as an airport, is our is that a top quality <coughs> airport? Is it? Uh, oh, the facilities. The facilities. Yeah, itself. there's nothing with the facilities of Bellingham that would dissuade a carrier from, from adding service. What would have happened in the last three years if we hadn't paid your firm $90,000 to go out and market for us? Yeah, I think um, it would be, it'd be difficult to speculate on that. Um, but I do, you know, our firm, whether we're engaged with airlines or airports, we make sure that we think that we're continuing to provide value. And uh, what I would say is there has been in, in various circumstances, both in my time uh, with Forecast and I think with my pre predecessor who represented uh, Bellingham previously where we've engaged carriers, we've convinced them to bring in more capacity, adjust their schedule to improve their performance. I think that that has been favorable for the, for the airport, for the port. Any other questions? I get, uh, two. One is airport related, and it's Punta Gorda, Florida. What, why, why would Punta, do you know anything about Punta Gorda? Why is it so popular in, in that one airline? What we're looking at that. Story? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's an airport that's it's kind of equidistant between um, Tampa and Fort Myers. So it, it kind of serves that, that area. It becomes a, uh, it's a much lower cost alternative for Allegiant to serve kind of the Fort Myers, Naples area uh, of Southwest Florida. Okay. I've never been to Florida and I'm looking at this map and I can't, I don't know. Can't. It'd be like, just like a two hour drive south of Tampa, I guess, if you're looking at a map. Okay. Punta Gorda likely wouldn't even be on the map, depending on how specific it is. Oh, but it's, it, a good, it's Google map, it's a good map. Okay, no, so I, then I'm, it probably I'm is. I'm zooming in on Allegiance Airplane right now in yeah. Punta Gorda. Okay, second question, uh, serious question, Spirit. Um, Spirit, they do a lot of east-west, so we've been very interested in doing uh, east-west here, uh, frontier, pulling out, it's a sad thing. So w is that the sort of thing that we'd be looking at? Would they be connecting flyers, especially from Whatcom County, that want to go to the east? Yeah, when, when we've engaged um, Spirit, just like when we engage any carrier, we talk about all the opportunities that we think there are. Uh, for, for Spirit, um, I think that there's opportunities southbound. Um, and, you know, they've got a decent operation in Las Vegas. They've done things San Diego northbound as well. Um, but then they do have several focus cities kind of in the Midwest states. I think that could be compelling. It's most likely something uh, I think that would be likely on a seasonal basis initially if we were able to, to work with them for summer-only service. Okay. But. So it might be worth just continuing to work on getting a, a consistent east-west. I know we're not like the, you know, the business hub of anywhere, but we are the business hub of Whatcom County. So yeah. I think that the, the business traveler here would appreciate that. But yeah. uh, now that the ultra low cost carriers, are, would they typically end up, uh, I'm assuming, Spirit and uh, ULCC? Yeah. Okay, so would they typically end up at a place that a business traveler or someone that, that wasn't just going on a vacation that, that, that they could get to a destination for, uh, like with a Spirit or another a similar Spirit type of uh, airline. So would they go to a, a market where they thought there'd be more business travelers? Was that the? Uh, oh, no, let me rephrase the question. So um, so getting back to the, like, so let's just say there's a business traveler here in um, uh, in Whatcom County and uh, a ULCC like Spirit or Frontier or anybody else, whatever they are, um, are they going to typically go to the places like Allegiant has gone to, you know, warm vacation spots, or w would they be going to some other places because they're not trying to compete with an Allegiant that's going to a warm spot? They're going to go to a different air airport in the Midwest or something like that. So, yeah, the uh, that's a that's a great question. So the dialogue with um, with Spirit, and I think what's compelling about them, and this is this is from our perspective as well, is that there is the opportunity for them to do North South Line. Um, out of Bellingham to kind of serve those leisure customers. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that is very favorable with Bellingham is that the market tends to respond to capacity um, because more people can just be driving across the border. So there's an opportunity from an airline's perspective uh, to stimulate demand. That, the portfolio of those markets is 
likely perceive it is perceived as much lower risk um, because it's a shorter stage length, which reduces your operating costs and it's a little bit more of a proven market. So my guess is that's more likely to become the first step. Um, but there is the opportunity, I think, for more things headed eastbound. All right. So we're still going to struggle with the east. Mm -hmm. West thing. Yeah, I think where the, the opportunities with the east-west thing likely for Bellingham would be more concentrated on connecting into another network carriers hub, whether that's Delta in Seattle, United in San Francisco, or Denver. Things of that nature are, are would likely be a much more effective mechanism uh, to, uh, to provide that utility for Bellingham customers. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from a commission sta commissioner's standpoint, I find it very frustrating that we have a, a, one of the lowest employment rates around. We have a beautiful airport, um, just first class as far as I'm concerned. And we've hired consultants to bring in more business. And the last airline we brought in was the last one to depart. And uh, we've, we've aggressively gone after the business and haven't gotten anything. And I, I just find that real frustrating. Mm -hmm. Can you address that? Yeah, I, I can address that question. I understand the frustration, and it's not, you know, I don't, uh, it's, n it's not as fun to come here and show a whole bunch of negative bars either. And, um, but the, the challenge is, is even, um, you know, I think the, the best salesperson here, it, it has a difficult, difficult time with some of the things that are happening in the macro environment. Um, the, other, the other piece that I would say is a lot of the focus really has been also not just on new carriers. Uh, that's not just our only measurement, um, but some of the, the new services that have happened with, with Allegiant and with Alaska. Um, and, and we'll continue those dialogues and keep pushing on those carriers as well. And it does, I, you know, I, I probably I can't put a number to it. Um, I think it would be it would be a bad number, um, but I would say that it. I feel very very strongly that we're providing value to the port. So Ben, um, there's two things at play here, obviously, and I think every airport has the same issue. One, we have to pay for the airport. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have a bill out for the new terminal. Um, the other is providing service for the people you know that we represent here. Um, so I, I see where you're coming from, Dan. I really appreciate that. Uh, speaking to that specifically with Alaska, so even if even if Alaska is getting um, pretty full airplanes from BLI, but they're going to have to respond to the pressure that Delta is putting on them in Seattle because that is Alaska's only hub. Is that correct? It's their largest largest, largest hub. hub right. It's about okay. fifty percent of Alaska's. So, so they're going to. They can't just add more airplanes. So this is the macro, the macro part of this discussion that you were mentioning just a moment, a mm -hmm. moment ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. The um, this is something with with Alaska that we're we're actively trying to reverse, just like with Allegiant. Um, it is just it's a little bit of a different story. Um, over the last few years, my previous position was overseeing capacity at Alaska Airlines, and when we looked historically at our most competitive Pacific Northwest carrier, we actually saw it as as Allegiant. Um, I think that dynamics change now, and so we have to we have to knock at the door a little bit louder. But we are in in active discussions with Alaska and in working to help build business cases for, for Bellingham. Jim, did you have anything else? No. Uh, Mike, do you have anything else? No, th I could pick your brain for hours, but thank you. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you, you very much. The uh, next item on the agenda is uh, an action item. If you could please read the action item. Uh, a motion Diana. authorizing the executive director to execute a settlement and release agreement with Rugby Aviation LLC doing business as San Juan Airlines for the collection of passenger facility charges at the Bellingham International Airport. Uh, thank you, Diane, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Daniel Zank, uh, Director of Aviation, once again. Uh, bring forward this uh, settlement agreement uh, as a result of about seven months of conversations between the port and uh, Rugby Aviation LLC. Uh, the story goes that uh, last year Rugby Aviation uh, purchased some assets and uh, some business interests from West Isle Air who was doing business as San Juan Airlines. Rugs Rugby's interest was to obtain the, the name of San Juan and take over the service 
as a scheduled air carrier service. It's a small commuter airline that flies from Bellingham uh, to the islands uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis. The conversations were a uh, difference between um, interpretation of uh, notification or proper notification of p passenger facility charge uh, that's issued by the airport, by the port, and whether payment uh, was assumed by rugby aviation uh, with the purchase of the San Juan airline name. So after several iterations, meetings, uh, discussions between attorneys, uh, and port staff. Uh, what you see before you is an agreement between both parties uh, to resolve the issue and move forward. Uh, rugby Aviation has been issued notification of the passenger facility charge, the proper notification, and in return, uh, they've agreed to move forward and pay the passenger facility charge effective April 1st. Dan, for clarification, Rugby Aviation is uh used to do business as Northwest Sky Ferry, which now is San Juan Airlines. That's correct. Just so we get the lay of the land for the folks watching on TV. Thank you. Yes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Gentlemen, any questions? No. Jim, did you have any? No, I just, the, the 3,000 is a settlement that's, that's correct. This has to be kind of frustrating on a lot of the uh, parties' parts here on the fact that um, these, uh, these charges, um, they weren't paying these charges as Northwest Sky Ferries. But when they purchase San Juan Airlines, the, the, there is a charge that they have to pay that they didn't under the old company. Is that correct? That, that's correct. The difference is uh, operating as Northwest Sky Ferries, it was an on-demand service, which falls into a different category and different definition uh, through the FAA. Uh, the, the PFC, or passenger facility charge, is uh, for air carriers with scheduled service. And that's where the difference lies. So San Juan Airlines that operated under West Isle, that was their original? That's correct. Name? And, and they were paying the PFC charge. And they were paying those? That's correct. So where did where, the confusion come in when they purchased San Juan Airline to not pay those, those fees? Um, I believe it was with just the purchase of the name and not the company itself. Um, and that's, that's where I believe the difference of opinion was. The port had one opinion, the, the uh, rugby aviation had a different opinion. Commissioners, in these kinds of issues, there's always two opinions. Um, they purchased just the name and then they started scheduled service and the uh, regulation requires a notice, and it was the port's position that the old notice continued on. Their position was we needed a new notice. In any event, they didn't collect the money from the passengers, so anything we settle with them comes out of their pocket, their operating revenues. Secondly, they, and unrelated to whether or not we should get the money, they said, well, this PFC goes into the terminal, and we operate out of a separate building. It doesn't really help us. And then third, they said, okay, we'll agree to waive notice and start collecting immediately, but you have to agree to, to cut what we have to dig into our pockets to catch up on. So that was essentially the settlement. They are an active customer of the port that provides important service to the San Juan Islands, and so it was a negotiated agreement. And Mr. Zank says that uh, the agreement's also, uh, uh, the FAA is not objecting to the agreement, so. So San Juan operates two types of businesses, if I understand this, one which is scheduled runs and one which is on demand. The on demand does not pay the fee, the scheduled one does pay the fee. Yes. Why would the, when this first happened, uh, how much money were we talking, $15,000 a year? Yeah, we estimated about 15000 Didn't we miss that on the first month of why that revenue wasn't coming to the port or from the 
fees? We, we did. And that's when we engaged with Rugby Aviation. We did right away. Uh, I believe it was, well, the consent to assignment was approved September 1st, 2014. Um, and I think we engaged in conversation October or, or late what, October, early November. I think that's what you told me before was October. So yeah. yeah. Well, I have no problem not going back and making them pay it because they can't collect it from the customer that's already gone and they couldn't charge them for. Um, and I'm, I have no problem with a settlement. Are everyone happy? Yes. Is, that, is everyone happy? I believe so. Okay, good. Well, uh, Jim, did you have it's anything further? We're going to do it's probably what it amounts to. Okay, Mike, did you have anything further? Uh, no, the settlement's fine. It's not, you know, it's perfect. It's one of those things. Uh, do you have a question about the, the service, though? So they were flying their own planes under Northwest Sky Ferries brand, and then they bought uh, all of the assets of San Juan? Uh, have they in Perhaps I should introduce uh, Skip Jansen with Rugby Aviation. He could probably oh, answer your questions a little bit more in more detail. Well, that's an easy question. Welcome. Now you know why I held the door for you on your way in, huh? <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't Thank know you. who you were. <laughs> uh, we we uh, purchased the name San Juan Airlines last spring from... West Isle Air. West Isle Air is still operating. Out of our airport? They can if they want. They're, well, uh, are they, are they, they doing the same runs they were doing? No. You're doing those? We're doing that. We bought the, the name and, the, and a couple of aircraft from them. But, so the, the question I got is, have you, um, with this purchase, have you been able to expand your levels, levels of service in uh, here in the state? Yes, we have. And it was, uh, as I was watching this, earlier presentation, I wanted to, to point out that our, our uh, business is up uh, March. Our business is up almost double what it was last March, and we're projecting a 20 to 30 percent increase to, in 2015 over 2014. So Are you it's interested not, in flying to Denver or Salt Lake <laughs> or <laughs> Chicago, Alaska? <laughs> so. So it's not all gloom and doom in, in Bellingham, and I would like to add that that uh, Rugby Aviation, DBA, San Juan Airlines, and Northwest Sky Ferry is Bellingham's only lo locally owned mm -hmm. airline, and we've been a commuter airline since 2009. So we, the way the the way the FAA regulates this is the the certificate holder is Rugby Aviation, and then you can you can purchase other names or do business as, as other names. Okay. That's it. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Skip, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anything else, Dan? Nope. Hearing no other questions, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 3-0. Uh, thank you. The uh, next item uh, is under facilities. If you could read the action item, please, Diane. Authorize the executive director to execute the deeds of conveyance to the city of Bellingham of the port constructed facilities described as West Baker View Sanitary Sewer 8-inch Force Main and 2, a portion of the Fairhaven Marine Industrial Park Water Main Improvements Phase 2 project, both of which to be accepted by the city of Bellingham for ownership, operation, and maintenance. Thank you, Diane. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm John Hergesheimer, senior project engineer. Uh, this is before you today to complete um, two items of work that was budgeted in 2014. Uh, uh, the first one is the West Bakerview Force Main replacement. This was a uh, upgrading in size of a city's uh, four inch force main to an eight inch to, uh, to more than double the capacity, actually it almost tripled the capacity of the pump station at uh, Bakerview and Mitchell Way. It's a city facility, but it was um, agreed that the port would replace the sewer main uh, in order to provide the upgraded capacity needed for the, the proposed hotel. 
at the uh, at the near the roundabout of Mitchell Way and the um, the upgrade to the terminal, the terminal improvements, including the the de-icing operations to the added uh, uh, apron that was uh, provided in 2012. And those were the concerns that the city had that there was not enough sewer capacity at those pump stations for this added growth. And so uh, cost analysis was run and this was determined to be the most cost effective and long range benefit for the port. Um, and so the project was uh, budgeted in 2014 and constructed in 2014. And we're before you today for the final segment, which is to turn over a deed of conveyance by deed of conveyance, which is simply a deed that, that takes uh, a port asset and turns it over, in this case, to the city of Bellingham. Then the city of Bellingham accepts that. And that's how that facility is then transferred for ownership, operation, maintenance, and long-term replacement from one entity to another one. The second project is the, the Fairhaven Marine Industrial Park water main. A portion of that line uh, is a city is uh, destined to be a city line that goes up to a demarcation point, which is uh, near the pressure reducing valve that's on the FMIP property uh, that then from that point on, the improvement that was done remains a port owned, port maintained water system improvement. And the reason for that is it feeds um, seven buildings and their fire systems. And in order for the, the, um, the whole system to, be, to have been taken over by the city, the upgrade of the fire systems would have had to been done at the same time. So this, this method of doing this uh, has allowed the port to then sequence out the work of upgrading that sewer system or that water system. The cost of the water system is about $650,000 as I recall for the total upgrade. The portion that this, the city will take over is 273 feet that goes from Harris down the, the, the driveway that's right next to Padden Creek and, and goes alongside of building one which is right next to Padden Creek and then connects into the pressure reducing valve system and the backflow preventer system that is the ports. And that's all a new system. So there's about 273 feet there of 12 inch water main that will be, by this action, would be deeded over uh, to the city for their ownership operation and maintenance of the facility. In addition, there is an added hydrant that was added on the east driveway to provide uh, a more uh, coverage of fire protection as the old system and the entire old system has been now decommissioned and everything down there uh, in, the, in the streets uh, of the FMIP, uh, including all the fire hydrants, are now brand new. And the old system is completely decommissioned. And we had, you may recall when we were budgeting this before, we had lots of problems with that old system failing and causing uh, major uh, disruptions of service. Um, uh, it blew out lots of asphalt and, and caused a lot of disruption over time. So, the, so this project then replaces that whole system with a brand new system. And the, this first portion going into the site then would be taken over for ownership, operation, and maintenance by the city. Okay, thank you, John. Any questions, gentlemen? Uh, one quick one. So when, when, you, uh, when you decommission an old water line, even though it may be a six or eight inch, uh, I'm assuming, you, is it drained or it eventually will drain? And are you worried, especially in a place like FMIP, that that, that small void can create a problem later? Well, that's a good question. I would generally, you're not worried about that. Um, the lines are buried deep enough that, um, and it's ductile iron pipe or cast iron pipe, so the vo any void created, um, we don't we don't normally go through and like pressure grout that up or remove the lines. They're just left in place, and okay. um, um, they will they're 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 fine if they don't have any water pressure in them. I mean, they're still pretty strong, right? So they're not going to like they're imminently collapse. But under the pressure that they're operating, they're expected to operate under, they have leaked in the past. Now without the pressure in there, without the water in there, they'll be good for a long, long time. Okay. Without, How without deep collapse. are they? 
They're in the, in the realm of, of four feet of depth, generally. Okay. Jim, any questions? No, sir. Okay. No other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, John. That passes 3-0. Uh, uh, the last item uh, on the agenda is uh, uh, action item number three. If you could please read it, Diane. Authorize the executive director to execute a professional services agreement with Moffitt and Nickel to perform condition survey, engineering, design, and construction support services for the Bellingham Shipping Terminal and former GP or Georgia Pacific Pier Condition Survey and BST, Bellingham Shipping Terminal Pier Repair Project in the amount of $147,000 plus a contingency of $14,700 for a total authorized contract amount of $161,700. Thank you, Diane. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Norman Gilbert, Project Engineer. Excuse me, Project Engineer. Um, this project consultant selection was uh, done through our standard RFP process, where we received six proposals. The selection team uh, selected Moffat Nichols as the most qualified. Uh, the scope of work here is essentially routine condition surveys at uh, two of our facilities: the Bellingham Shipping Terminal and the Georgia Pacific Pier. Uh, the Bellingham Shipping Terminal has received these condition surveys um, approximately in a five-year cycle for the last 10 years, so this will be the third uh, consecutive survey. The Georgia Pacific Pier, this will be the first one uh, that, that has been undertaken since purchase of that facility. Uh, the scope also includes the underwater and under pier assessment of uh, damage from the December uh, 2014 horizon incident. Uh, where the vessel broke free and and caused some damage, so we'll get a scope of of those of that damage in in the repairs. Um, so the the scope here is just for the condition survey. There there will be future amendments uh, to include the repairs. We have a budgeted capital project for this year for repairs at the shipping terminal, which uh, this will help to outline the scope uh, for that work. With that, if there's any questions. Thank you, Norm. Any questions, uh, Mike? Yes, I'm trying to find the documents online real quick. Uh, the GP, GP pier, so we're talking about, we're talking about the, uh, the pier that's in the upper part of the waterway. I'm sorry. The, the, part, the, the pier that's in the upper part of the waterway, not any part of the shipping terminal pier. That's a completely separate item, right? Correct. It, okay. It's the uh, the portion of the Georgia Pacific Pier that extends into the log pond and then heads okay. towards town. Okay. Just verify. Uh, so this condition survey, because I've, I've suggested in the past that this might be an asset that we can hang on to as a, uh, as a public access point. Uh, in the meantime, waiting for um, the city to eventually build a park along that that edge. So what, what are we looking for exactly uh, when we do this condition survey? Is it, is it intended, <clears throat> intended to inform us about um, Dan Stahl's needs in tying up uh, vessels, or is it more uh, a condition survey that would, would tell us that it's suitable for? What's, what are we looking for? What's the answer we're trying to find? Uh, both of those scenarios. So we're looking for the, the, the um, condition of, of the facility as, as a whole, um, so as a final product, we'll get information on the loading of, of the deck for people, cars, equipment, and we'll also get a condition of the moorage system there for the cleats and the fender piles for the barge tie-up, ship, ship tie-up. Will, will this help us? Um is this, is this intended to be used? Where's Brian? Are we using this for any part of the cleanup, the waterway cleanup? Or are we going to... I think that was used in the, during the during the, um, the Squalcom Harbor dredge a couple years ago, right? Right. Um, actually, is John... Oh, yeah, John. Did John leave already? Yeah. I'm not sure that if it's, it's, if it's part of the offload area like it was for the Squalcom. Um, I do think that that area is anticipated to be part of the Whatcom Waterway cleanup. This, the pier itself will be remaining in place. I'm sure that, that uh, portions of it will be accessible for the contractor and available. How they choose to use it for offload area, I think, is yet to be determined based on okay. how they bid it. But I think it will be available as a loading and, and lay down area for the contractor as part of the Whatcom Waterway cleanup. Okay. 
And uh, one, one final thing. So during the inspection, there's a, there's a lot of bulkhead down there that you could see from the from the, the deck, but I, I can't tell what it is. Are we looking at that or just are we just looking at the piling and that sort of thing? The main focus is going to be on the piling, but they will be doing a visual of, of the bulkhead. Okay. How long have those piling been there? Thank you. Do you have any idea? Uh, which, which piling? The ones that they're going to be testing. Uh, well, the uh, piling at the shipping terminal have been there since the early 60s, at least the timber portion of those. Um, we've done various repairs and, and replacements more recently. Uh, 1990 is the center section. Um, Georgia Pacific, it, it's, it's really unknown. Um, we can go through some of the, the files and find out when they did repairs. Core of those, right, and find out what's... There's a very various level of, of inspection, including coring of, of certain piling, correct. I must have misunderstood Mike's question. Did you ask if it was just the GP? Oh, no, I just wanted to make sure that I was talking about the right peer. Cause it's both of them. Yeah, it's both, it's both peers. Okay. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Any, f any other questions? Anything else? Right. Did you have any? If you had any other questions. Mm -mm. Mike? No. Mm -mm. No. Uh, hearing none other, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Master Commissioners. Steel. Thank you. Any new business, gentlemen? I don't think I have anything. Mike? No. I'd like to... Um, I'd like to give our executive director a compliment. We uh, had an issue come up with uh, Cowden Gravel that needed something changed uh, on the way we were gonna haul our uh, dredging out and the, the, they couldn't go by truck and we got letters from the, a couple of city council folks in Cowden Gravel and by gosh, that thing was solved in about three days and I really appreciate that. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, the credit there goes to Fred Seeger and Mike Stoner, both of them and their teams uh, worked really hard and uh, met with various folks, folks including uh, waste management services to determine the correct outcome. Well, thank you very much for all those involved. Any other business? No, sir. Hearing none, we're adjourned.